So up until this point, uh, we've talked about um, tree structured uh, representations of syntax uh, before, like dependency parses or phrase structure parses. And this time, I want to talk about representations of semantics. Um, and uh, there was recommended reading. Um, it, the reason why it was recommended and not required is because I, it's relatively extensive. But if you haven't taken a look at it, the, uh, the reading on semantic structure is very kind of informative and interesting, I think, although it doesn't really cover neural models. Um, so just to briefly summarize what was in the reading. So syntax only gives us the, the structure of the sentence, um, it, whereas what we would like to know is what the sentence really means. And this is not necessarily you know, directly derived from the, uh, from the syntax. Um, and specifically, when we're talking about discrete uh, semantic structure, we want to talk about things that are kind of grounded in an operate operationalizable way so you can basically execute the structure with a pro uh, program and use it to do something uh, that you want to do. So one really typical uh, version of this is answering questions. Another thing is uh, following commands. Um, and you know there's many other things that you can use your uh, semantic structure to do. So um, one of the difficult Things in semantics is how do you represent, uh, represent semantics in the first place? And I think Ed Hovey teaches an entire class on this. So um, uh, I will not be covering that in a lot of detail. But um, the, for the purpose of what I'm going to be talking about this time, uh, I'm going to talk about two different varieties. One is special purpose representations that are designed specifically for a particular task that you want to do. And another one is general purpose representations, which are designed to give you a uh, a representation of the sentence meaning uh, that has certain properties. Um, and uh, the reading talked about these general purpose representations in all the desiderata, which is, you know, uh, basically things like things that have the same meaning, have the same representation, for example, the obvious stuff and a lot of other things as well. Um, and I'm also going to talk about um, shallow representations, where shallow representations aren't meant to, meant to capture the whole meaning of the sentence, but only a portion of the meaning of the sentence, but still a useful uh, portion. So um, because a lot of the work in, uh, in this area works on uh, parsing to special purpose representations, I'm going to talk about that first. Um, and some examples of this include uh, database queries. So let's say you want to answer a question and you have a big database of facts that you would like to ans uh, answer it from. Uh, it's very common to create queries to this database and answer them. So um, another way you could think of uh, doing things is just train a sequence to sequence model that takes in a sentence and out, uh, takes in a, uh, a question and tries to output answers. Uh, kind of the advantage of doing it in this discrete way is that you have a, um, a highly efficient database query language like uh, SQL oh, that can take a structured uh, uh, take a structured database and query it according to what you uh, what you want to find and that's highly efficient you don't have to encode your whole database in uh, distributed representations etc so this is why these methods are still very popular uh, especially in practical settings um, also, uh, robot command and control language uh, is another example. Um, another example that I, I particularly am, am very interested in is uh, uh, source code as a uh, meaning representation language. So source code uh, also tells you what you want to do in an upper, operationalizable way. So there's a bunch of tasks, if you're interested in this, uh, that are widely used. So uh, GeoQuery is an example uh, query task. So this is um, basically what it looks like. Is it has this uh, language, or it has this uh, input, what is the population of Iowa? And then it has this kind of tree-structured language, which says answer um, NV population NVV1, uh, const V0 state ID Iowa. And um, so basically, this is telling you that you want to answer a thing where the population uh, where you get the population of uh, a constant Iowa. 
Um, there's also things like parsing to the Freebase query language. So Freebase is this big knowledge base. So this is another uh, that has a structured query language over it. Um, so in this case, you have uh, what are the neighborhoods in New York City? Um, and you uh, go to neighborhoods New York and then X, and that would list all of the ones. And then it also has uh, simple commands, like how many countries use the rupee, and then you can uh, do count in this. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, this uh, lets you answer lots of different kinds of questions. Um, there are many others, web questions, wiki tables, uh, et cetera, but I, these are kind of representative ones here. Um, example command and control tasks. Um, one widely used one is RoboCup, where you basically are telling robots to play soccer. Um, and uh, it looks something like this. So if our player four has the ball, then our player six should stay in the left side of our half. Uh, so then it's uh, T owner R4, uh, do R6, position left, half R, uh, et cetera. Um, so this uh, in programming languages is called a domain specific language. So a domain specific language is a language that's uh, only to solve a particular problem. And there's a lot of work in parsing into these. Um, another one that's kind of a little bit broader is if this, then that. So this is commands to smartphone interfaces. So this is hopefully obviously useful to you if you want to build, like make a startup uh, or something like that, where you have a natural language interface to your app. Uh, so uh, there's an example, which is call me if the Cubs score. So then um, it's if uh, ESPN uh, says there's a new in-game update uh, about the Chicago Cubs, um, then phone call, call my phone. Uh, so it's like you interface with one app, and then if there's an, um, then interface with another app to, uh, to call, to uh, do an action. Oops. Um, and for uh, code generation, um, there are things like generating implementations of uh, of card games, so you take in this card, uh, like this card is worth three, uh, does anyone play Hearthstone? It's like worth three mana. three blue things, <laughs> mana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, three mana, and uh, its name is Divine Favor, and then uh, the action is draw cards until you have as, uh, as many in hand as your opponent, and it's implemented in this class. So you want to go from this description to the, the class. Um, and also uh, Django commands. So um, you have lines from the web framework Django and convert a uh, call frequency into an integer and uh, substitute it for self that call frequency. Um, like this. So there, there's also a really nice data set that just got released that's unfortunately not on the slides, which is uh, natural language to bash commands. So you can do stuff like um, uh, Find all of the uh, find all of the files in this directory that start with a, which seems pretty useful. And then it outputs R RMRF directory <laughs> <laughs> because you know it's a neural net; it can do whatever it wants. Um, okay. So um, now going on to methods. Um, uh, a first attempt at these, of course, like all of our other first attempts, uh, use sequence to sequence models. Um, so the idea is you, you start out with um, original examples, like what are the major cities in Utah, what states border Maine, um, and then you try to directly output the thing, uh, you try to directly output the, uh, the meaning representation for this database. Um, so they tried this, and um, it didn't work. Uh, that well. It didn't work anywhere near the state of the art at that time, which was based on grammar-based models. So they had a simple idea, which is like, we should just make more data. Um, you know, sequence to sequence models work really well if we have lots of data. So they, um, they basically take the original examples, they learn this grammar-based model from these, and then they randomly generate new, um, new examples and use this to train the sequence to sequence model. And after they do this, uh, then it, it ends up working pretty well. So um, this is good where you can take th this limited data and learn a uh, asynchronous context-free grammar from it, which works well for this very limited geo-query data set, but probably doesn't scale uh, well to more, uh, more complicated things. Um, 
So the next thing that people did, um, uh, one thing I should mention though is that this is a very good idea. So if you have a small data set, um, if you have a small data set and you want to create uh, data to make your method more robust, creating synthetic data and feeding it into a model with high capacity is certainly one way to do it. So I'm not trying to discount this method. Uh, it's certainly something that you could think about doing if you want. Yeah. Um, so the question is, if you can use a CFG to generate data, could you potentially use that CFG to achieve the task that you're trying to do? And the answer is um, no. And the, re the reason why it's no basically is uh, because this will allow you to create extra examples that will make your sequence sequence model more robust. But the sequence to sequence model, because it can do things like um, kind of do soft matching of words, or um, if it if it isn't something that's in your CFG grammar, it can still potentially handle it by learning from the other things uh, uh, in your training data. It has the potential to generalize beyond uh, just the stuff that you generated here. And there's another example of this in syntactic parsing, where basically they took a syntactic parser that was parsed on the, that was uh, trained on the pen tree bank, used it to parse a whole bunch of other data and then trained a big sequence to sequence model on it. And after they did that, the sequence to sequence model actually outperformed the original parser because of its ability to generalize better from the data that it had. So um, that's a very good question, but the answer is you can still improve upon uh, what the original CFG can do. Yeah. So if the amount of data that you generate outweighs uh -huh. your Could this hurt your ability to generalize? And I think the answer is yes, basically. So this is not a this is not a method that will solve all of your problems. But um, what it could do is uh, there are other examples in machine translation where you just take nouns and you replace them with another noun in the dictionary uh, to kind of pre-train your machine translation model. And this makes it more resi resilient uh, to not just memorize the sentences that you've seen as is, but also be able to swap in things in slots, et cetera. So I think um, even simple data augmentation methods like this improve your resilience to some extent. Any other questions? OK. So a next, um, a next attempt at uh, doing this is saying, we're going from a sequence uh, to a tree structured um, meaning representation. Um, and I talked about a bunch of kind of nice ways to go from a sequence to a tree before. Um, this one kind of developed independently of these other ones for semantic parsing itself. Um, this method, what it does is it basically splits the semantic representation into an upper level, uh, into the second level, into the third level. Uh, because there's kind of a natural way to, like if you have a tree uh, that's, uh, that's like lambda uh, uh, zero um, e, and then you have a, a subtree down here uh, like this. It's and, and, and. Basically what they do is they have this, uh, this top-down model that, uh, that generates the top one, and then any time it gets the special end symbol, it generates the second level uh, by passing the, pair, the state of uh, the LSTM at the top level down to the second level, and then starting decoding from there. Um, so this model kind of works. It works a little bit better than a regular sequence to sequence model on this task. But um, in my personal opinion, you know, the, the models I talked about for parsing last time, uh, like the stack LSTM, seem to be a little bit better, uh, better tailored to the task because they have a specific composition function that considers all of the, uh, all of the previous uh, things as well. But this is something that you should be aware of if you're uh, working on semantic parsing tasks. Um, so these were things that were specifically tailored for kind of general uh, semantic parsing to domain-specific languages. And in parallel, uh, there have been models that are developed for uh, doing stuff like code generation. 
Um, so the problems that you have in code generation are a little bit different. Um, particularly in source code, there's a significant amount of copying that you need to be doing in order to uh, get things correct. So, um, for example, if we have this, uh, this card down here, which is called uh, Curian Ford Ring with eight mana or, or whatever it is, um, you, in your code, you have uh, init, and then you have the name of the, uh, the card, because you need to have the name of the card. So you need to copy the name of the card, obviously. Um, so what this, uh, what this method did is basically it did a character by character generation model, but it had the ability to generate whole words um, where you copy from the name or copy from other things like this. So this is actually kind of interesting. Um, interesting from another point of view in that it is a, um, it's a mix of a character and a word-based model. So even if you're not interested in code generation itself, if you're interested, if you have a task where um, you would benefit by generating characters one at a time because it would improve your generalization, but you still want the ability to copy words, then this might be something to consider. Um, yeah? What's the input exactly? Is it the image of the card, or is it? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. It's not the image of the card. It's a structured representation of the card um, in the format. You can actually see it on the very top line here. It's, um, you have one embedding for the, the number in the top left, two embeddings for the number on the bottom, uh, then the name, uh, then uh, the actual like text of the card. So um, yeah, so that, that's what they did here. Um, so another, another important part um, of uh, of generating code or uh, tree structured representations is handling the syntax appropriately. Um, so code has very defined syntax. So do uh, so do semantic representations. So um, specifically, code uh, has syntax in the form of abstract syntax trees. So if you put uh, code into a uh, into a compiler, or parser, or interpreter, or something. It, turns this code into a tree-based representation that you then used to interpret. Um, and you can do a, a tree-based model that generates uh, this obeying the code structure. So this is actually a paper by, uh, by us, but there was, a, um, there was also another uh, similar paper at the time that had a, a similar motivation. So if two people think of the same thing at the same time, it's probably a good idea. <laughs> Uh, but uh, so basically, the idea is we create this tree. We take the um, we take the Python code, uh, sorted my list reverse equals true. We run it through an AST parser to create the tree. Then we have a model that generates basically grammar rules. So these grammar rules uh, look like a CFG rule, uh, which is root to expression, expression to expression value, etc. And then it's basically a sequence to sequence model that generates these rules in pre pre-order traversal. So it goes down the left side, then the middle side, then the right side. Um, but every time it also references its immediate parent. So if we get up to this, uh, this middle thing here, then it's also looking at its parent. So it uh, is able to pass the information directly from top down. So. And this, uh, this seems to, to work well. It's, uh, it does pretty well on generating Python code, um, which is more difficult than uh, domain-specific languages normally, because domain-specific languages have these very small trees compared to the Python code, which has very large trees. Yeah. So, is it just generating arbitrary code that compiles, or is it faster? So, this, um, this like anything else, this is um, this has an input, uh, which is sort my list in descending order, and then it tries to generate the implementation of that, basically. And you need, uh, you need training data for this. And there are a few training data sets, um, like, uh, the, like the um, playing card data set that I just mentioned before, um, the Django data set of Python commands, and also the Bash data set that uh, just came out. So, it's yeah. just simple commands, like sort something, or? Yeah, so that's a, good, list, right? that, that's a good question. So one of the difficulties in this is it's very hard to move beyond one-liners, obviously. So, um, 
you, what you really would like to do is you'd like to get some abstract command like write a web browser for me. And then, <laughs> and then Safari pops out or uh, <laughs> something like that. But uh, you know, that's too ambitious, I think. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty far off. Uh, but you, know, you would like to move beyond one-liners and have things that are a little bit more complex. And I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit uh, more next. Uh, it, were there any other? So this is this is a abstract syntax tree for Python, and um, the Python interpreter basically includes a thing that parses Python into this yeah. format. And that's uh, that's true for any modern programming language. Any modern programming language, if you have a compiler or interpreter, will be able to do this. Yeah. With respect to the evaluation, is it evaluated based upon what is the exact one line that you're looking for? Uh, in that case, the problem is that it might generate some other one line which does the job right. Uh -huh. And in the second way, if you're just comparing the output after it actually executes, yep. it might not be doing the correct thing, but for that particular example, it said that this was already in the descending order. Okay. And it just printed the list. So the output still matters. So that's a really good question. Maybe I'll get back to it in three slides or so after I talk about uh, some evaluation. Uh, any other questions? No? OK. Um, so this directly relates to the question that I just got uh, here. So learning, learning signals for semantic parsing. Um, when, you want to, um, when you want to do this sort of semantic uh, parsing task where you're going to an uh, executable meaning representation, um, the easiest way to do this is for any natural language utterance, you just manually annotate uh, a representation and treat that as true. So um, one example of this is the GeoQuery data set where um, you have what is the largest state that borders Texas, um, and then Z is annotated. Z here is your, your meaning representation. Um, in standard data sets, GeoQuery, there's also ADIS, flight booking, RoboCop, etc. But the problem here is that these are, are very costly to create. Um, uh, one maybe exception for this is when you're doing code generation, because there's tons and tons of code, uh, but then it's difficult to get uh, that aligned to appropriate English. So you're still kind of uh, stuck with the same problem, I guess. So it's really also really common in semantic parsing to do weakly supervised learning. So what I mean by weakly supervised learning here is um, sometimes we don't have the annotated logical forms. Uh, so what we do instead is we treat the logical form, uh, the meaning representation, is a latent variable. Um, and uh, basically train from only the input and the desired output. So um, uh, what is the largest state uh, that borders Texas? Um, and uh, the answer to that is New Mexico. So the meaning representation itself isn't given, uh, but if you get New Mexico correct, then your, uh, your output is treated as correct. Um, so within, this can be framed as a reinforcement learning problem or, uh, or a latent variable problem, basically. So um, what you do is you uh, try to generate these forms, you get a reward based on whether you got it correct or not, and then you, uh, uh, then you feed that back to, as a learning signal. So one problem with this is sometimes uh, you can get the right answer without actually doing the right thing. So um, if, you're, if your list is already sorted, then no matter what you do, uh, you'll probably get a sort of list back. So um, uh, here's an example from a, a paper where the idea is that you want to go, it says the man in the yellow hat moves to the left of the woman in blue. So you start out with, uh, with this thing on the left. Um, and what you want to do is you want to achieve the thing on the right. Um, and the correct thing is you need move has hat yellow left of has shirt blue, um, which is the kind of correct logical form for this uh, for this uh, the original English. But we could also do the spurious thing, which is just move the person in the red shirt to position one. 
um, which is shorter, so you're more likely to get it by chance if you just randomly output things. Um, so this problem of spurious logical forms has been, uh, has been investigated by this work, and they have a couple tricks to fix this, like um, uh, encouraging exploration in your model and also making the gradient updates more even across the various uh, things that you uh, discover. Um, so if you're interested in, in this, you can uh, do this here. So um, to get back to your question then, uh, which was a very good question, this kind of answer is part of it, I think. So if you're talking about supervised learning, then basically your target is getting the exact match. It's getting the exact thing that gives you, um, uh, that was annotated in your data. So a lot of work does evaluate with respect to this. Um, if you're talking about weakly supervised learning, you just want the answer to be correct. So if you, want, if you think about uh, QA-based semantic parsing, then if the answer is correct, it's treated as correct, um, and you don't actually hear about the logical form. Um, you could also think of, um, for something like code generation, creating a bunch of unit tests to test whether the code does the thing that you actually want it to do. Um, and then if it passes the unit tests, you get a score of one. And if it doesn't pass, you get a score of zero. Um, this is a separate thing called programming by demonstration. Uh, this is widely used in a separate thing called programming by demonstration, where you don't use natural language. You use uh, just input-output examples. Um, and they, they're both kind of common things to do research on, but there's not very much work re like combining both of them together, although there's a little bit of work from uh, natural language programming, uh, combining the natural language programming and programming by demonstration. Um, so uh, are there any other questions about this? I'll move on to the next one. Yeah, sure. Do people try to, I guess, combine them? So if you have a very small set of manually annotated alignment data and then like to do semi-supervised learning, I guess? Oh, semi-supervised learning. Yeah, there, there is uh, some work on semi-supervised learning. Not a whole lot, but um, uh, yeah. So I, um, I actually forgot one one other nice piece of work. So, um, yeah, so I, I guess, yeah, so pe people do, do do work on, some work on semi-supervised learning. I, I don't have uh, references to give you uh, right now, but yeah. Um, yeah. So to clarify, in the semi-supervised case, uh, you have both the logical form as well as the correct answer. Yes. Um, you don't necessarily even need the correct answer. You could just have the logical uh, because you're just training directly from it. So. Yeah, any other questions? Um, okay. So one other really kind of interesting thing um, in one strong argument for uh, doing something in this way as opposed to have, having an end-to-end -end, uh, sequence sequence model that just outputs the thing that you want to output is that these things, um, these logical forms actually can be relatively interpretable. So um, if you are trying to do a particular task and you get an output, um, if your output is something like Python code or a SQL query or a bash command, a human can actually look at it. And um, a human can actually look at it and say whether it's correct or not, uh, more or less. So there's been some work in doing kind of human in the loop uh, semantic parsing um, that uh, uh, basically allows these systems to interact with humans to make them uh, work. So for example, um, uh, there was a paper on generating SQL queries uh, where you have this thing that uh, you input what you want to do in natural languages and it outputs a SQL query. Um, and the good thing is there's hundreds of thousands of developers in the world who know SQL, so you can just ask them, is this correct, and then they go in and fix it. Um, and you can feed that back into the system. And by doing this, they showed they were able to make a natural language interface to, uh, I, I believe it was the Semantic Scholar Citation Database or something, uh, in 12 hours or something like that. So um, uh, it's a non-trivial non -trivial data app access application through natural language that they were able to make by doing this. Um, another piece of interesting work is where you kind of build up a library of components gradually by interacting with the user. And um, the idea is this. 
So you have a programming language that allows you to draw things on the, uh, um, like draw things in a 3D world and make, uh, and, and make a 3D scene. So they, um, the first thing they do is they say add a palm tree, uh, which is this very high level command. Um, and then the system says, sorry, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to draw a palm tree. So then uh, the user then breaks it down into, and says brown trunk height three. And it, says, it still says, sorry, I don't know how to do that. Um, and then it says add brown top three times. And now we've gotten down to the level where the system understands and it repeats, um, it repeats the action three times of adding brown top and then you, uh, and then you get something that kind of looks like a trunk. And then it says go to the top of the tree um, and then it goes to the very top of has color brown and then it says add leaves here um, and then select all sides then add green. And you can build a palm tree and then the next time you say add palm tree it still remembers this. So you can go back and say uh, add palm tree next time. So these are kind of interesting if you're interested in making interfaces that people uh, interact with. Uh, neither of these have a really strong uh, like these aren't dependent on neural networks, and in fact, the second one might be a little bit more difficult to do with a neural network-based model, but I, I thought they were uh, interesting as a method for supervision, so I thought I'd introduce them here. Um, any other questions? Yeah. So uh, for the previous parsing these things, mm -hmm. can you kind of restrict your outputs of the networks to generate valid sequences, if not correct? Um, this one. Yeah. yeah. For Yes. So use like a context-free grammar that's actually there to generate the part of right. So th this will restrict you to only grammatical things, only things that follow the grammar. If you have a, if you have a CFG that fully specifies the grammar. Yeah. Um, one thing that it can't do, or this particular thing can't do, is it can't prevent you from doing uh, something like one equals one. Um, so in Python, one equals one is not a valid statement. Uh, but according to the CFG, it, it's fine. So it won't necessarily generate perfect things, but um, everything can, will turn into something that looks like a well-formed program, I guess. Um, anything else? OK. So um, up until now, this was all for um, for special purpose representations. And these are kind of interesting because you can uh, use them directly for a specific task. Um, but there's also a lot of work on parsing to general purpose meaning representations. And this, uh, this can be useful if you, want, um, if you want a representation that can be used for a lot of uh, things downstream. And is kind of, uh, you don't want to annotate new data for each task you do. So you first have this intermediate representation here. Um, so, as stated in the reading, there's a lot of desiderata for these. Uh, for example, uh, verifiability. So, um, it can be connected with a knowledge base or something like that. Um, unambiguity. So, one representation should have only one meaning. Um, a canonical form. So, one meaning has only one representation. And uh, inferenceability. So, you should be able to draw conclusions on top of this meaning representation. And also, expressiveness, uh, so it should be able to handle a wide variety of subject matter. And um, because doing all of these at the same time is impossible, um, people have been studying better and better meaning representations uh, for a long time. And now there's a lot of uh, options that you can use for these. Um, so one common one is first order logic. So logical uh, symbols, connectives, variables, constants, etc. cetera. Um, so for example, um, one example from the reading is there is a restaurant that serves Mexican food near ICSI, is uh, exists, restaurant uh, serves, etc. So if you've taken a semantics class, I think this looks uh, very familiar. Um, and also, uh, you know, all vegetarian restaurants serve vegetarian food. Um, it's also common to add lambda calculus. If you're familiar with lambda calculus, this basically allows you to define functions, which can be very, uh, very useful, especially when doing uh, compositional uh, representations of natural language, uh, which are good for parsing things. 
So one um, very popular form of representation, uh, first order logic is kind of the old school way of doing things that people still use now, uh, but have been using forever. Um, a relatively new one is abstract meaning representation. And the idea behind this is it's designed to be simpler and easier for humans to understand. And it's also in a graph format. Importantly, this is not a tree format, it's a graph format. Um, so what this looks like is if we have uh, the boy wants to go, um, we, uh, we look here and we have a boy, um, we have go and we have want, and the boy is, uh, the boy is going, so it's arg zero of, of go, uh, but the boy is also wanting, uh, so it's arg zero of want, and uh, arg one of want is go. So, um, you know, you're, you can tell kind of each of the actors, or each of the verbs in the sentence, how do these represent with each other? And one of the good things about this is there's a large annotated uh, bank of this. I, I believe it's 40,000 sentences or something like that, which is on the same scale uh, as the pen tree bank uh, for syntax. So that means uh, you have enough data that you can actually try attempt to train a neural model uh, on annotated data. Um, uh, are there any questions on that? Or? Um, so there's also lots of other formalisms, like minimum recursion semantics, um, which uh, uses a variety, it's a variety of first order logic that strives to be as flat as possible to prefer, uh, preserve ambiguity. Um, and also uh, uni universal conceptual cognitive annotation, uh, which is an extremely coarse-grained annotation, uh, aimed to be universal and valid across languages. So there's all these uh, different options with, uh, with trade-offs between them. And, uh, because there's annotated data sets, of course, people have tried to parse to all of them because that's what NLP people do. Um, so the important thing here is that all of these are in graph structures. And the reason why they're in graph structures is uh, illustrated very well by the example, the boy wants to go. So the, the boy is the one who's doing the going and the boy is the one who's doing the wanting. So you need a thing where basically um, a single actor can uh, it can be a part of multiple actions, for example. And the most natural way to express this is a graph. Um, and uh, the way people do this, there's a lot of different ways to do this, but if you want to generate a graph, the most common way to do it right now is with a transition-based uh, parsing algorithm, like the ones I talked about two times ago. Um, and they add special actions to allow for the fact that some, uh, that you're not making trees, you're making graphs. Um, so one example of this is having right arc uh, not reducing for AMR. So this means you can draw arcs between uh, multiple identical things. Um, and you can also do things like adding different transitions, like remote uh, node in swap transitions. Um, Another thing is performing linearization and inserting pseudo tokens for re-entry actions. So um, this is all very abstract, but just to give an example, um, uh, this is one transition system where basically we know shift and reduce already. Um, but in addition to shift and reduce, we also have things like node, left edge, right edge, left remote, swap, uh, finish. So things become a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Tree-based represent, well, it depends on what you want to represent, I guess. Um, it, the reason, the motivation for this is if you want to know that the boy is the one that's wanting and the boy is al also the one that's going, there's no immediately trivial way to get that from dependency structure, for example. So um, it's very... It's very obvious that that's the case uh, if you look at something like a, a graph-based representation. Yeah. For the boy wants to go. Yeah. The dependency part is simple, right? Because the boy is the handler for both wants and goes, which is fine. The boy. Yeah. The issue is if you have two things that connect to. That's not true. The boy isn't the head for both wants and goes. Not not in any dependency representation I know. Because verbs are always ahead, right? 
Yeah, and each child can only have one head. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, are, are there any other questions about this? So um, one thing I should note is it, um, if you're parsing to a graph structure, there are other, probably other reasons why you would want a graph structure on the out, uh, output side. These are not bound to any one, uh, one semantic representation. So you could certainly uh, use that uh, for graph parsing as well. Um, and just to give an, another example of linearization for graph structures. Um, so basically what they did here for AMR, this is kind of complicated, but they basically have these uh, these four steps where they um, where they turn this into a linearized thing, um, and then they uh, they replace um, they replace each of the uh, like things like January with month and year, etc. Um, they replace locations um, and. What what's the last one? And then they add yeah. Then they add brackets to ensure that this is uh, this is bracketed appropriately. So um, it's certainly possible to uh, to do this in a linearized form. But as you might expect, the things that are actually explicitly considering the graph structure tend to tend to do better. Um, okay, so. One of the things that you might have heard in a semantics class or in an NLP class in general is there actually is a very close connection between syntax and semantics. So when I say it's not trivial to get a graph structure from a dependency representation, I'm saying it's not trivial, but it's not impossible because there is a very, uh, a very close relationship between them. So, um, the, the way these syntax-based semantic models work is basically you parse into syntax, then you convert uh, this parse into meaning. Um, so one example is uh, going from a CFG to first-order logic, which was actually shown in the textbook. Um, you can also go from dependencies to first-order logic. This is non-trivial. You actually have to train a model that allows you to do this or come up with an elaborate rule system uh, that works on particular languages. Um, but the most common way to do this is through uh, something called com combinatorial categorical grammar, uh, which is a syntactic uh, formalism that is kind of popular because of its uh, simplicity, uh, but also the fact that it gives you very natural ways to convert things into logic. So um, basically, the way CG CCG looks is something like this. Um, it's a... Um, it's a syntactic formalism that basically only has two, two or three symbols. I, I think there might be one more symbol that I'm forgetting, but it only has basically S and MP, uh, where MP is a noun phrase. But the tags over each word are actually um, the tags over each word are actually compounds of these tags essentially. So if we have a um, in English, if we have a transitive verb. A transitive verb will always on its right side take a, an object and on its left side take, take a subject, right? Because that's, uh, that's the way transitive verbs work in English, uh, in English grammar. So the way we, so borders is a transitive verb. So borders um, basically looks like this. Um, so what this means is the slash means on the right side I am expecting. Uh, in NP, and then on the left side, I'm expecting another NP after I take this thing on the right side. So um, you see borders uh, combines with Idaho, and um, it takes the NP on the left side, and then because we've taken the NP on the left side, now we, we cross this off. And then now we have just S backslash NP, and then um, we combine on the uh, the left side with an NP, so we cross this off, and this gives us S, which is a sentence. So this is basically um, an alternative way of uh, describing grammar. Um, and the nice thing about this is then we can combine this with these uh, lambda calculus functions. So the lambda calculus functions also take, uh, they essentially take the, um, the arguments in a particular order, so now 
Um, once we're done with this syntactic combination, we can get borders uh, Utah, Idaho, which is the semantic representation of this. Um, if you have wet states border Texas, uh, things become a little bit more complicated. You get these more complicated combinators. You get these more complicated lambda calculus functions. But what you get out is now you have a lambda calculus function where you can get state. Uh, basically, it says, I am a state and I border Texas. Um, and you're looking for all the things at all of this. So um, it sounds really simple as I describe it here. There's actually a whole book on CCG grammars. Uh, so it's not actually this simple. But um, the fact that you can talk about many of these things in a whole book about that big uh, kind of attests to its simplicity. So a lot of people like, uh, like this as a formalism. Um, so this gives you very strong syntactic constraints on which tags can combine together. On the other hand, it gives very much weaker constraints than CFG on what tags can be assigned to a particular word. So for example, if we have a CFG and we have a verb, uh, a word, uh, it might only become a verb, for example. Um, uh, like that would be the only tag you could assign to it. But if this verb could be uh, transitive, or sorry, uh, intransitive, transitive, or bitransitive, it can actually get three of these uh, CCG tags. Um, so the way you do parsing in these grammars is different uh, for, the, for the two different ones, for the two different uh, formalisms. Um, and because of that, one way that people do uh, CCG, one thing that people do in CCG parsing is something called super tagging. So super tagging is basically tagging with a very big tag set. Uh, for example, the CCG uh, uh, tags. So um, you are essentially doing something that looks a lot like part of speech tagging, um, where you predict this tag for each, um, predict this tag for each word. Um, so it is exactly a tagging task. It's just that your tagging, your tag space is huge. Uh, so um, once you do this, uh, if you have a really strong super tagger, you basically um, can reduce CCG ambiguity to the point where if you can pick a single tag set, you can essentially have a deterministic parse uh, for the rest of the sentence. Um, so the kind of state of the art for this uh, is a standard LSTM tagger, but a few uh, tricks. So for example, um, modeling the compositionality of the tags. So obviously, uh, the tag for borders here and the tag for what are, sorry, the tag for borders here and then the tag after you combine borders with Idaho is somewhat similar. So um, they basically have a, a compositional function that looks at the what the tags look like and, um, and uh, models the embedding of the tags using this. Um, and they also used uh, scheduled sampling to perform error propagation. But basically, this is kind of a, a very strong method for uh, CCG super tag. Um, are there any questions about this so far? No? OK. So this is just one example of syntax to semantics. Um, this is kind of the old school example of syntax to semantics, going from uh, going from a discrete syntactic representation to a discrete uh, semantic representation in lambda calculus. Um, so there's a very nice example of um, a kind of modern approach to this, which says we're taking a discrete syntactic representation, but we want to have a much softer kind of neural uh, semantic representation. Um, so the idea is basically we, um, it's also possible to use syntax to guide the structure of neural networks uh, where each structure of the neural network has a semantics. So um, this is uh, neural module networks. Um, and the idea is basically we take what are the cities in Georgia and then according to something like a dependency parse, we uh, get look up Georgia we get relate, uh, relate in, we have and, uh, and then we have find city. So if you remember, 
This might look very familiar, right? This is uh, what states border Texas. We have um, borders Texas, we have uh, what states, and then we combine them together into a semantic representation. So the basic idea here is instead of having lambda calculus, we now have these yellow, blue, orange, and green uh, things, which are parameterized neural networks that perform a uh, specific type of semantic com composition. So um, then based on your knowledge source, you have a knowledge source in embeddings. Um, you combine these embeddings, like look up Georgia, we'll look up the embedding for Georgia. Um, in will do some sort of composition uh, based on the, the um, preposition in. Find a city will also have its own uh, thing, and then we can, um, we can combine these together all the way up uh, through a neural network stretch. Um, so I think these are, this is a very elegant architecture, but it's not the easiest, uh, not the easiest one to implement. So uh, if you're brave, I, I recommend this. If you're not brave, then maybe I don't recommend this, but uh, it's, uh, it's very elegant at least, yeah. Do you happen to know how results of this have been like this compared to something um, yeah, it's uh, uniformly better if you apply it well. So, um, uh, one example uh, where this has been very successful is in kind of like visual QA tasks, um, where uh, you have something like um, what what is the what is the object that is above the red ball or something like that, and then. Um, by coming up with uh, things that basically take the structure and manipulate your attention in an appropriate way based on the semantics of this according to the structure of the sentence, uh, you can do much better and you can generalize much better is, is the important thing. Yeah. If I recall correctly, they also learn the composition in this paper, right? So, so in, in this paper, yeah. So a, in, in this particular paper, they started out with dependency trees, I, I'm pretty sure, and then they learned uh, to adjust it in the appropriate way, um, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I, I know they did that in at least one of the papers, and I think it was both of them, but uh, I, I might be wrong. If, yeah. any, other, any other questions? No? Okay. Um, so the last, uh, finally I have two slides on shallow semantics. So um, everything I talked about up until this point is a tree structure or a graph structure over the entire sentence that you're trying to parse. So um, sometimes this is very good, um, but sometimes this can be a little bit of overkill. So um, for example, uh, if you only want to know who did a particular action. You only want to know who wanted to do something, or you only wanted to know, um, uh, yeah, so let, let, me, let me show an example. So she blames the government for failing to do enough to help, or um, I'll knock on your door at a quarter to six, uh, Susan said. So in this case, if we have blame, we have somebody who is judging something, we have what they are judging and why they are judging it. So the idea behind um, semantic role labeling is basically we have, a, uh, we have a verb or a predicate and then we need to decide um, like who is doing what to whom. And uh, so all you do here, this is a tagging task where given a verb, you need to tag the spans that uh, apply to each of the arguments of the verb. Um, and the state-of-the-art neural model for this at the moment is actually extremely simple. Um, so it's just a deep uh, LSTM. Um, and what you do is you input, the, uh, you input the sentence, you run through a bunch of layers of LSTM, and you have a, a zero, 1 binary uh, input about what, uh, um, you have a zero, one binary input about what is uh, um, the predicate that you're looking to uh, distinguish between. Now, the, this is one of those examples where they did a lot better at parameter tuning than anybody else who has attempted this task. So it's possible that if you took a more well-formed tree-structured model or something uh, and did the equivalent amount of parameter tuning that they did here, 
uh, you would do a better job. But right for the moment, uh, this is certainly the state of the art for the task, and uh, did gave a very nice improvement on the standard benchmarks. Um, that being said, this is a shallow semantic task, so maybe uh, maybe it's easier to solve it in that way. Yeah. This is just indicating which verb you're looking for the predicate for. So I, I can show you an example of why this is important. So if we see uh, she blames the government for failing to uh, do enough to help, um, there's two verbs in this sentence, right? There's blames and there's failing. So you need to know which one you're currently attempting to tag. Um, so if in, in this case, we would put in the binary one on blames. But uh, we might also put the binary one uh, together with failing. And in that case, it would try to, try to find the uh, arguments for failing. Yeah? How does this compare to frame semantics, like frame structure semantics? Well, I think it, it's basically a, it, as far as I understand, semantic role labeling is the act of discovering frame structured semantics from text. So it, um, Basically the same, uh, but th this is the task and frame semantics is the representations. And so neural models significantly also find the previous two versions of the task? On this, uh, yes, this, uh, this paper is, is uh, the state of the art right now as far as I know. Yeah. All they're doing is predicting, well, sorry, not all they're doing, but they're primarily focusing on just the binary labeling of the evoking concept. What do they do to actually label the arguments? Oh, OK. So sorry. If you look, the output is on the top here. So it's a BIO tagging task, a beginning, uh, a beginning in, out, uh, like I talked about for uh, named entity recognition. So they have beginning arg0, in arg0, beginning verb, beginning in arg1. So um, and, uh, I believe they also, as far as I know, they also have other ones for the other like types of arguments that uh, um, a semantic role can have, uh, like um, like act, actor or, or whatever else. Right, so they're primarily focusing on like the uh, Focusing on the so one. like bring that I think as richer. Um, this is a good question. So what, what rules are they attempting to label? I actually don't exactly remember how they evaluate it, but you could take a look at the paper to see. Yeah. Wait, are, are they able to uh, like choose a word that is outside of their training for like verb? Are they able to choose a word that's outside of their training data for their verb? So if they um, never saw blames, are they still able to tag? If they never saw blames, are they still able to tag? That's a good question. They might they might discuss that in the paper, but I honestly don't remember. Um, my intuition says that if you are initializing with pre-trained word embeddings, so the answer may be yes, because even if it's not in your training data, you would still know what type of verb it is and other similar verbs. Um, but I I don't know. Any other questions? Okay. Um, yeah, they, they have a, a good error analysis. So the model is so simple that they had like seven pages to do error analysis. So, <laughs> um, so that's one of the that's one of the good things about uh, about this paper. Um, so uh, so that that's all I have for today. Hopefully, if you're interested in generating uh, kind of semantic representations, uh, this is useful. Uh, if you're not interested in generating semantic representations, uh, now you know how to parse into graphs. Uh, if you don't care about graphs, then thank you for listening. <laughs> uh, no, no more questions. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much.